Good morning. Great to see everybody this morning. A lot of good uh, snacks in front of a lot of people here. I've got mine too. Let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you that your word is true and we can count on every last bit of it being true. Lord, we thank you for the truth that sets us free. And we ask that it would do that here today in everything that we discuss. God, may your Holy Spirit guide us in our conversation. And may Jesus Christ be glorified in our midst, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm heartened to look around and see that most of you came back in spite of what we're talking about. Who can uh, tell me what we finished with uh, last week? Talking about uh, women's suffrage. Thanks, Bill. We're talking about uh, women in the church. And the reason we're talking about it is not because uh, I have a death wish. We're... We're talking about it because uh, we've been going through chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14 talks about propriety in worship. It talks about how to do worship, and the majority of the time, it's talking about um, how to use our spiritual gifts in the context of worship. <clears throat> and so for the last several weeks, We've been, uh, we've been looking at what the Bible says and seeing the wisdom of what it says there. As I said uh, on a number of occasions, the Corinthian church recognized that they had spiritual gifts. I hope St. John's re uh, understands that you guys have gifts too. You have spiritual, amazing, supernatural gifts that God has given to you to be of use to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so the first thing is, is find out what your gifts are. Second thing is, is then use them in the way that God intended them to be used to be a blessing to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can do that, and we should do that outside of this building in our own individual lives. You know, there are times, like I think about one time out in New York, um, I was working at the Good Samaritan, which was our um, uh, food and clothing bank out there in, in New York, and somebody uh, called in and said, I can't make it to come get food. Could someone bring me food because my back is so out of place? And so I was working with my daughter, Hope, that day. And she and I, after working our two-hour shift at the Good Samaritan, drove over to this guy's house, uh, and he was sitting in a chair in agony, and, uh, and Hope and I laid hands on him for to be healed of his back, and he was instantly healed. That wasn't at church. That was just in our day-to-day -day walk. And God wants you to do that same thing with the gifts that he's given to you. And so that means that, you know, you, you say to the Lord, God, whatever you want me to do today, set up divine appointments for me, help me to trust you, and then help me to step out of the boat and do what you're calling me to do. And that might mean laying hands on somebody and praying for somebody at the grocery store. That might mean that you're praying for somebody and God gives you a word for them and you recognize because of what we talked about that that's a word of prophecy and then sharing that word with them that they might be built up in the Lord. There's a, And there's lots of ways that you can use the gifts that God has given to you. But chapter 14 talks about using them in the context of the church and the worship service. And then the last few verses talk about the place that, that uh, women have 
in uh, the worship service. And that's what we've been talking about from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, hopefully many of you brought those uh, these back. Otherwise, there's a few more copies still up there on the, on the music stand. So the difficult passage there uh, says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church without doing anything else, without looking at other passages, that sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? It looks like, from first glance, that it's saying, women, come, but don't say anything when you come to church. Don't participate. Just sit there like a bump on a log. But that is not what it's saying at all. In fact, as we looked at last week, um, if, you, if you do a word study, uh, it uses the word learn there. And if they want to learn something, if you look at that word and look at where else it's used, it's also used in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it's talking largely the same thing, but you have a better context. What he's talking about there is women serving as pastors. So what is he saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 14? He's not saying women don't participate in church. Because three chapters before that, in 1 Corinthians 11, he talks about the right way that both men and women are to prophesy in church. So he's not saying in chapter 11, women prophesy in church. And then in chapter 14, he's not saying Never mind, I messed it up. Women, be quiet. He's saying the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 2 as he's saying in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 14 that in this one office in the church, which is overseer or pastor, uh, depending on which passage you're looking at, it is to be reserved for God's reasons to be uh, to be done by by men. And we talked about not just any men. Not just any man can be a pastor, as it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we looked at that, where it looks at, it says, if a, here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer or pastor desires a noble task. And then it goes into all the prerequisites of being a pastor. And every pastor, if they're honest with themselves, would say, I don't like this passage very much because it makes me feel bad. <laughs> it makes me realize I need Jesus' forgiveness and I need his empowerment every day because that is quite a list of prerequisites of being a pastor. What are your thoughts so far? Anything that you've been thinking about throughout this past week on what we've talked about? Bill? Bill? Oh, yes. Pastors are held to a higher standard. If you go to James chapter 3, it says not all of you should even want to be spiritual teachers because they will be held to a higher standard. I don't like that passage either. You are not going to be held to as high a standard as I am. God is going to uh, hold you to the standard of the gifts that God has given to you. But God, in addition to the gifts that he's given to me, has given me a platform. And I'd better use that platform for good. We're not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about that he is holding me to a higher standard. That is not a salvation standard. It's not that I'm going to lose my salvation if I'm a bad pastor, if I give a bad sermon. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's talking about that God has a, uh, God has a, um, 
a high standard for pastors and in some way, shape or form. And this is something that we don't like to talk about a whole lot. I don't want to really get into this because this could be another six week <laughs> study. Um, but in some way that we don't quite understand, um, when we get to heaven, there's, uh, there's something called the judgment seat of Christ. And it's not probably what you think it is. When we think judgment, we think uh, judge if you go to heaven or hell. Uh, that is not what the judgment seat of Christ is. Uh, I believe in the in the Greek, it's the bema seat. And, uh, and what it is, is it's where the judge would sit when uh, the winners of a race or a competition would come up and stand and the person on the bema seat would give the laurel to each one, first place, second place, third place. So it was all about getting, uh, getting your reward. And, uh, and when we get to heaven, God, we're all going to stand before the Bema seat of God. Now, this has nothing to do with salvation. And, you know, last place and you get to be in heaven is better than first place in hell, right? But remember this, God doesn't forget anything that you do for him. What does he forget? Your sin. Hallelujah. Right? But what doesn't he forget? He doesn't forget anything that you've done for him. There's that passage where he tells Peter that. Peter says, what about us? We've given up everything to follow you. And basically, Jesus says, nothing that you've done will ever be forgotten. And then on the day that you are standing before the Lord, there will be rewards that he will give out. And what that looks like, you know, we can only kind of guess. Uh, it seems like from one of Jesus' parables that some of that will be dependent upon, uh, you know, our faithfulness will be dependent upon the uh, the responsibilities that he gives us in heaven. You know, uh, heaven is not going to be sitting around on a cloud playing a harp and singing in a choir. Thank God, right? Even if you like choir, you're like, I can only get so much of singing in a choir. Uh, heaven is a place just like this. It's a society. And, and everybody plays their part you're going to be going to work. Oh, man. But it's not going to be like work the way that you know it. It's going to be very fulfilling work. Remember, Adam and Eve in the garden, they had work to do, but it was very fulfilling work. And in heaven, there's going to be work to be done, and there's probably going to be bosses, and there's probably going to be... Uh, you know, uh, uh, people that are just, you know, the average person working in each one of these jobs. And the way that God determines who gets what position largely is, is our faithfulness here. So what I'm getting at is that, you know, my, there may be a lot of pastors, uh, and I don't know about this, but you get the point. There may be a lot of pastors in heaven that are cleaning toilets. Because God held them to a higher standard and they just didn't do quite as well, right? And there may be people that, like I always think of this one guy at, out, at, uh, out in New York, Mike. He always washed the tables. El Didsbury. Mike Didsbury. Mike Didsbury from New York. If Mike, if you're watching, hi, Mike. Uh, Mike, every week after service, would get out the tables and put out the pizzas. In New York, we had pizza after every 11 o'clock service or sandwiches. <clears throat> the reason that they did it is because people were walking out the door 
without saying anything to anyone else. And, uh, and so Pastor Cummings had this idea of let's, let's bring food in so everyone sticks around and talks with each other. And so every week they would bring in either pizzas and, and don't think that they were great pizzas because in, in New York, they, they only do cheese pizzas, right? And not even the whole lot of cheese. It's not that good. But uh, but they do cheese pizzas and uh, and drinks, or sometimes they would do sub sandwiches, and everyone would stick around and and just mingle and talk and and pray for each other, and it was really cool. Um, so what Mike would do, Mike Didsbury would do, is he would quietly get out those tables every week. He would set out all the food and all the napkins and all the plates and all that kind of thing. And then after everyone had eaten, he would throw all the boxes away and he would wash down all the tables and put all the tables back. And he did it without any thankfulness. And there would be so many times I'd just be watching him going, what a servant. If that's what God had called him to do, he did his job well. Mike Didsbury might be your boss one day in heaven. Um, so, um, yes, so not everyone should want to be a pastor because he's going to hold you to a higher standard. Other comments? Yes, Marlis. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. Um, actually, it's in here, I think. Yeah, right. Um, so let's, that, based on that question there about 1 Timothy 2, let's keep going through this because I do have this in here. Um, so we looked at, do you know, does anyone remember where we left off? I think we got through the first page, didn't we? So let's just start on the top of the second page and let me know if I'm off somewhere. Going back to 1 Timothy 2, what is Paul's reasoning for women not filling the roles of pastors in God's church? Can someone read verses 11 through 15? Okay, so like I said, we're, <laughs> I'm really, P Pastor Ryan, could you come up and finish this? <laughs> I don't feel good. <laughs> no answer. Uh, okay, I'll try. I'll try. Um, so, the reason he's saying here that he doesn't permit women to have authority over men in the church, this has nothing to do with outside the church. Can a woman, uh, according to God, be a president of the United States? Absolutely. Can a woman be a boss in a, uh, in a business? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he walks away, yeah. <laughs> All he's talking about here is in the context of the church, right? In the context of the church, he says that he doesn't permit a, uh, a woman to have authority over a man. In other words, he doesn't permit a woman to be the pastor of men. Uh, and then he goes on to say, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. He's talking about Genesis chapter 3, where it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. 
You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Before we get into the questions, what are some of your thoughts as I read through that? Yes. The question is, is he saying that women are more easily deceived than men? No. We're going to get into it, but men and women are deceived in different ways. Um, but the good question. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Yeah. Yeah. What was Adam's job? He's the head of the house. And that means as the spiritual head of the house, his job is to protect his family from sin. He fell down on his job, didn't he? Um, so absolutely. It was Adam's job to say, Eve, Satan's trying to deceive you. Don't eat from it. As for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord, right? That's what he should have said. He did not. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, it seems like, and we don't know everything that was said between God and Adam, but it seems like, <laughs> it seems like God told Adam, you must not eat from this tree in the middle of the garden. And then Adam then shared it with Eve. And whether Adam messed it up and added that line, or whether Eve messed it up and added that line about not touching it either, we don't know. Or if God had another conversation that we are not told about, and he added that line as well, we don't know. But for whatever reason, what God told Adam and what Eve told Satan were different things. So I don't know if it was, uh, you know, you play telephone. And uh, by the time it gets to the last person, you don't even know what the first person said. Uh, if it you know, just kind of got lost in translation or what. Uh, but she added something on there. Yep. Yeah. 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 It doesn't seem like they're like huh? shocked. You know, a talking serpent. Huh? It's, it doesn't seem like they're shocked. So it's almost like they had had interactions with him before maybe, or they knew of him at least. Uh, but uh, but it only took once. Yeah, the, the worst, th what's the worst part about deception? It's deceiving. <laughs> right? The worst part about deception is you really, really, really think you're right, and you're not. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, did the devil know fully what was going to happen? I don't know. He, uh, he was already mad at God and already wanted to. And, and you know what? This is just, we can't say this for sure, but, but uh, you kind of wonder if he was jealous of Adam and Eve. Right? God makes the heavens and the earth. And you wonder if Satan, who was one of the archangels of God, said, who's going to be in charge of it? Me? And God goes, no, I'm, man is going to be in charge of it. 
they're going to take care of my earth. Why man? Why not me? No, your job is to take care of man. Maybe jealous, angry at God. I don't know. Bill. Um, well, it, what I think what's even more interesting is why did Satan attack Eve? Right? And I think that's kind of, Satan understood something about Adam and Eve that he went after Eve instead of Adam, even though Adam was there. That's interesting. And maybe we'll get into that here. Uh, look at verses 5 and 6. Why did Satan word his temptation to Eve in the way he did? What convinced Eve to disobey God and eat of the fruit? Okay. Put doubt in her mind. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay. Uh huh. You're on it. Mm hmm. <laughs> you're you're right. I I think I think you're right. She really desired to grow. Spiritually, out of the two sexes, who, un out of the two sexes, who by and large wants to grow spiritually? The women do. Look at the churches; they're full of women. Where are the guys? Fishing. <laughs> Honestly, they're fishing. Not fishing for men. They're golfing. They're fishing. They're doing everything else other than spending time with the Lord. What are the temptations for men and women? See? Adam's temptation was to just not spend a whole lot of time with God, thinking about God, doing anything else. But God knew that Eve really wanted to grow spiritually. Adam, he probably couldn't get him away from his video games, right? <laughs> he couldn't get him away from his, you know, I, well, I would, I, would, uh, I would go after Adam, but he's out in his fishing boat like Pastor Ryan. Uh, by the way, he's a really good fisher. <laughs> Or he was in the garden working, or right? Because men sometimes find their, uh, you know, their their self confidence and in, in work, you know. So maybe he was just off working and not spending any time with God, just work, 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 work. But Eve wanted to grow spiritually. Uh, Eve saw the fruit as desirable for gaining spiritual wisdom. Which of the two sexes is most uh, often desiring spiritual growth? We said it, women. Very important point. Satan always tempts people in the direction they are naturally leaning. All right? Um, if, if you're leaning, if you're, if you're lean, and Satan always, I really believe this, I believe he always is looking at which way we lean and then pushes us to the, extreme in that way. So if you're leaning a little bit toward thinking that you're a terrible person and, and you know, wondering if God could forgive you, is he going to try to give you spiritual pride? No, that'd be silly. 
He's going against the grain. He's going to try to push you even a little bit farther so you despair of yourself and think that there's no way that God could ever save you. On the flip side, if you think that, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I'm a pretty good person. He's not going to bring you to despair. He's going to try to push you so that you think that you're the best thing since sliced bread. He's going to try to bring you to the point where you think beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're more spiritual than everybody else, and you're earning your way before God. He's looking for the lean and trying to uh, push you farther than you should go. Mm. That's interesting too, Jim. You're right. You know, like, uh, that's part of the curse, right? Part of the curse for Eve was is that you will desire your husband's position. You will desire the authority that comes with being the husband or the spiritual head of the house, uh, but it won't go the way you want it to. And so was that already kind of growing in Eve a little bit too? Could very well be. Can you see why this was such a strong temptation from the enemy for Eve? She wanted to grow spiritually, right? How many of you, you don't raise your hands, but how many of you women like drug your husbands to church? Quite a few, I would imagine, right? <laughs> Drugged them, then dragged them. <laughs> yeah. Right? You're, you're going to go to church with me, right? But I, it's my only day to go fishing. You're going to church with me. Ah. Right? And, and so he saw Eve's lean. And thought, I think I know how I can do this. I can push her too far in her lean so that she will want to grow spiritually so much that she's equal with God. Um, we talked about this. What are men's temptations usually? Dumb things. Things of the world, right? Things that don't have anything to do with God. Think of what men are tempted by. Th cars. <laughs> right? Sex. Pleasure. Uh, you know, fame. Fishing. <laughs> right? Hunting. They're tempted by things that have nothing to do with anything spiritually. And that's why women kind of sometimes shake their heads at men and go, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Don't you know that we're all going to die someday and we're all going to be before the throne of God? And you just, you're 80 years old. What's the problem with you? You still are so distracted by the things of this world. Women have different temptations than men do. And so, you know, Satan probably knew that just like just like a, a wife says to her husband, would you come to church with me? No, I'm tired. It's my only day off. No, it's my only day to go fishing. I already set up a tea time at 8.15 on Sunday morning, right? And Satan probably knew if he tempted Adam, he'd be like, no, I've already got things I need to do. Oh, but I can work Eve. Because she already wants to grow spiritually. Start to make sense? Yeah. This is true. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Um, when I went out to New York, like the church that I served in in Wisconsin was very similar to this church. 
Uh, we had all male elders, uh, but we had both male and female church council and a vibrant women's ministry. When we uh, went out to New York, the f- one of the first things I noticed was not only the elders, but all the church council was all men too. And so I asked Pastor Cummings, I said, where are the ladies on the church council? And he said basically what Tim just said. He said, it's not that women can do a wonderful job with it, but we have found out here that if we allow women to do those positions, the men disappear. The women di- or the men disappear so they can go fishing, right? So they can be distracted. And so he said, it's not so much because of the women that it's because of the men. We're trying to force them to step up and do their job. Now, you know, you can look at that one of two ways and you can say, I don't like that or I do like that or whatever else. But that's the way that uh, that, that church had run to get the men to step up, because otherwise they did not. I have to say that I'm very blessed here at at St. John's, where we do have men and women uh, serving in a whole lot of positions, including the church council. But the men, they do a pretty good job. We have a lot of men on our church council. Um, And a lot of amazing women. On our church council. So the question is, is well, why do the why do the elders, why are the elders all male? Well, our understanding of elders is they are an extension of the pastoral ministry. They help the pastor do the pastor's job. So that's why we have all male elders, um, because of what God says about um about pastors. And it also talks about elders as well as being men in uh Timothy and Titus. Questions on that? Satan, yes, as far as we know, was male. He understood men. I get it. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. I thought I thought you were going in the whole direction of he understood men. He knew there's no way I can get him undistracted. But that's a different concept. That's a different concept. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's interesting too. Yeah, men. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, men may be angry for a little bit, but then they got to go check their fantasy baseball team and then they, they got to go fishing and yeah. 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 Women women really care. 
They, they really care. And, and this is just basic biology that, that men and women's brains are very different, right? Uh, men have brain damage. Literally, because when they're, when they're in the womb, from my understanding, uh, little boys go through a testosterone bath and it actually damages the brain. And so there are connectors between the two lobes. Yeah, it changes it. That's a better way to say it. Not damaged. So, uh, but there's connectors between the two hemispheres and the testosterone actually damages some of those connectors on purpose. Um, and, and women don't have that. And so all the connectors in their brains, everything's connected. And, and so if a woman says to you, uh, if you say to a woman, what are you thinking about? And they say nothing. They're lying to you because a woman's brain never shuts off. It's constantly going. And everything that is going on a women's, in women's brains is connected with emotion. That is how it's supposed to be. And think about it. In, you know, uh, throughout the history of the world, you'd have women that have 8, 10, 12 kids. She's got to be she's got to be doing all kinds of things all at once, right? A man usually uh you know for the majority of humankind was like hunter gatherer. He had to be focused on one thing. Hunt, right? And uh and and so you know men only usually are able to focus on one thing at a time, whereas women can do a whole bunch of things all at once. That's right. Catherine and I, I'm sure, both have shared that when we were in our first few years of marriage, I went out to mow the lawn, and I came back in, and she asked me, what were you thinking about while you were mowing? I'm like, what was I thinking about? Making straight lines. <laughs> And she says, you've got to be kidding me. I said, no, if I don't think about it, my lines are all over the place. And so I, you know, the whole two hours that I'm out there, I'm like straight lines, straight lines, straight lines. And she said, I could never do that. I think about my brother. I think about my parents. I think about, you know, the kids. I think about all these different things while I'm doing it. I can't do that. I'm a man. I've got brain damage, right? And it happened when I was in utero. And, uh, and so men and women are very different. God, God has made us different on purpose. It's a countercultural message, <laughs> right? But Christianity is increasingly becoming countercultural, right? There, there aren't, there aren't a hundred different genders. There's two and they're very different. Not according to the world, but you know what? The world doesn't give me my truth. The Bible does. Bill. Yep. Yep. You know what, Bill? Remind me this week. Maybe we'll watch that little section of that video this next week. It's really good. Yep. Um, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> the only the only angels that we that are given names are male. Does that mean that there are male and female angels? I, I guess, in my opinion, we don't know. Uh, Satan sure was. He hates us. Yep. Um. Well, men are for competition. They look at all the 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Don't talk to me about church. I got to watch the Indy 500. <laughs> right? Don't talk to me about church. I've got a golf game. Right? And and it's just it, that'll lead me to the next the next line here. Ladies, how does it make you feel when you are eagerly seeking the Lord and more spiritual wisdom and then you see your husband or other men either apathetic toward the things of God? or wrapped up in other pursuits that have no eternal value. How does it make you feel, ladies? Shake your head. Seriously? Right? And especially, and this is why the Bible says that we are to be equally yoked as husbands and wives. Right? So, I think there's not many unmarried people here, right? But uh, this is why this is why you just want to talk to the young ladies and say, "Don't missionary date." You know, don't date someone trying to change them. If they do change, chances are it's only going to be for a short amount of time, just to win your approval. But then, once you sign on the dotted line. Uh, they're going back to who they were most of the time. Every once in a while, uh, you'll find, I have a great buddy who um, he, he and his family were never churched, never really did anything with the Lord. He married one of our best friends, and now he is a tremendous dad and a tremendous spiritual head of his home. But that is, that's true. That's true. She broke up with him before he became a Christian. And uh, and that forced him because he he liked her a lot. That forced him to figure out what is Christianity all about. But that was 22 years ago and uh and he is still a great man of God and I'm very thankful that he's my friend. Um Okay. I wait I want to have the mic. <laughs> receptive to looking for spiritual wisdom he has designed us to work together so that those things that we receive from the lord men organize and singly focus on carrying out and making sure whether it's in leadership roles or in you know whatever that that the things that god calls us to do get done yes thank you yes the um the way that god has made men in light of the fact that he called some men to be pastors is on purpose, right? Uh, we have to have a singular focus. And if the focus is on the right thing instead of your golf game, if the, if the focus is on the right thing on God, and that is your focus, uh, instead of having... 20 things that are all going on, that's a really good thing. Uh, and uh, and for other reasons, too, uh, God absolutely knew what he was doing in calling men to be pastors. Yes. God didn't make any mistakes. Nope. He definitely didn't. But... You know, like I said before, ladies, how does it make you feel when you're really seeking the Lord and your husband's some deadbeat that just isn't spending any time with the Lord? Uh, it's got to be hard. I've never been a woman. Don't know if that's a shock to anyone, but I've never been a woman, so I can't understand. But as much as I try to put myself in your, in your high heels <laughs> or your flats, Right. As much as I try, I can't quite completely understand, but it must be hard. It must be hard to say, you're the spiritual head? Cheapers. 
You can't, you, you can't think about God for 10 minutes a day. I'm trying to seek after the Lord every day. I could do a better job than you. I can see that. I get it. And that was the curse, right? That was the curse that Eve was going to have to go through because of sin. I could do a better job than that goofball. Yeah. Yep. 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 That's true. And, and women really have a, a really difficult choice to make because on the one hand, if they say someone's got to be the spiritual head, I'm going to be the spiritual head. And you know what? There's a part of me that goes, I agree with you. If the man isn't going to step up, somebody's got to lead your family close to Christ. Thank God for godly women. Right. But what ends up happening sometimes in that case is the man, maybe he was like 3% going to step it up. But after he sees her step it up, he's not going to fight with her because he knows that that is a losing effort for him. Because he knows he cannot compete with her and her lifetime of reading the Bible and praying and knowing Jesus he doesn't know God that well because he hasn't spent any time with him. And so if she steps up, he's going to go, oh, good, you do it. And there's no way he's going to become the spiritual head. Or he's going to say, wait a minute, that's my job. And then he's going to be angry with you, right? Or the other uh, situation is the woman just goes, forget it. You know, if he's not going to step up, I'm not going to step up either. And then the whole family is lost. Yep. Here's the statistic, if I remember them right. It was right around 80% of uh, children, if both mom and dad regularly go to church, 80% of the kids will go to church as well. If only dad goes to church and not mom, it's right around 50% of the kids will go. If just mom goes and not dad, it's under 30%. There is something about a dad being the spiritual leader of the home that makes a difference in those kids. Yeah, Priscilla. Oh, it is. And I, and I agree with you in that it is not easy. I think before the fall, men and women, Adam and Eve, saw their strengths and their weaknesses as complementary. After the fall, we see our strengths and our weaknesses, and we are in competition with one another. And, but by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we can once again see each other the way that God wants us to see. Yep. The, f the first, the first two years that I was a, that I was a, that we were married, I saw this woman as my competition and I'm not going to win that one. She's smarter than me. She's better looking than me. She's, she, she, I was not going to win it, but for whatever reason, my competitive nature, I was in competition with her. And it wasn't only until two or three years into our marriage that I realized she's not my competition. She's my best asset. When she succeeds, I succeed. She has wisdom. She has skills that I don't have. And so for me to not utilize those is missing out on the gift that God has given to me. And so instead of being my competition, then after that, she was, she became the first person I would go to when I needed something. Yeah, Bill, last comment.
I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bill Cook is cooking. That's right. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we can discuss, Lord, uh, just the beautiful ways that you've made men and women. And God, uh, we ask you that uh, in our own personal lives, that we would not fall to the temptations of the devil, uh, regardless of what those temptations are. Uh, but Lord, instead, that uh, as we turn our eyes uh, to Jesus Christ, as we receive his forgiveness, and as we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us, that we might experience true manhood and true woman, womanhood as you created it to be. And we know, Lord, that whenever we follow you, there is true life to be had. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. Come back. Don't leave the church.